If you feel at all nudged by that video or prompted in some way to go and serve in September, we would really love to have you on this trip with us to Russia. You know, it's interesting because reaching out to orphans, as James said, was true religion. And I think that's partially because there's a big part of our faith that says that we were actually adopted into the family of Christ. In some ways, all of us were orphans pre-knowing Jesus Christ. And so we have experienced that love of a father adopting us. And even though we might have had a great earthly father and great family, there's still that sense of being adopted into a bigger eternal family. And so caring for widows and orphans is an opportunity to go to a place like Russia and care for people and share that love that we've received uh, by being adopted into the family of God um, with other people. So we'd love for you to come be a part of that. Uh, Capital's been committed there for years. Um, some of the kids that Craig would have first met when he would first went there are now married and having their ki- own kids. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I mean, to just be able to walk through that journey with people is such a powerful thing. That's the benefit of being a part of a community that's been around for so long. Um, interesting enough, the artwork that's currently in our hallway is done by Cherie, and she's donating 50% of all the profits to the kids in, orf- in these orphanages. So that money is not being given to pay for airline tickets to go. That money is actually being given to care for the orphans. So if you like the artwork that's there, if, it, if you want, <laughs> it's bright. So you're going to want to brighten up some living spaces in your home. Uh, this is the right artwork for it. And, uh, and you know that in your purchase of that artwork, half of that profit is going to fund uh, what God's doing in Russia. Thursday night, we did things a little bit different. We mixed it up. We called it Arise. It was meant to be a typical night of worship. We were feeling as a, as a leadership to do a night of worship, but then as we kind of got our brains wrapped around it, we thought, you know, we know how to do nights of worship at Capitol Beach Church. We've been doing them for a long time, but we had a sense it was needed to be different all the way to the point that we decided that we wouldn't even have an agenda for the entire night. Now, there's a lot of people at play in this church, and everyone needs to know their part, and when you're telling everyone to show up and not have a part, everyone's like panic mode, okay? So, We all showed up, and sure enough, a few minutes before we walked out here, we were panic planning what was going to happen if God decided not to show up. And uh, and we came out on the stage, and and it just started. Craig opened up with a kind of kind of an experience that he had had, and wanted to offer up um, to pray for some people, and said, "Hey, like if you're feeling in your heart that you really want a fresh touch from God or a stirring of His Spirit in your life, or you haven't had that before, we want to pray for you." And we thought a couple people would stand up. And a lot of people stood up. And it was instant chaos. Because we're like, we're, we're, we got to pray for it. So we're trying to run around. Mark Steele rips off his in-ears, jumps off the stage. Stu, Stu puts her microphone down, runs off the stage. we got to pray for people. And God just moved in our midst. And it wasn't something that we did. It wasn't like we brought him down. It was that we came acknowledging he was already here. And when we came acknowledging he was here, he met with us. And God just did just such a sweet thing that whole night. So we are having another night. Um, This coming coming Thursday will be Arise again. We'll be looking about how, when we should fit these Thursday nights in as the year goes on. But this coming Thursday night will be Arise again. I really encourage you to come. Uh, We are also doing it around a baptism. So if you've never been baptized or you're baptized when you're a child and you've never publicly declared your faith in your life and you want to do that with this community, we'd love for you to sign up and be a part of that night of worship slash baptism. So we're stoked for that night because at least we know there's a baptism happening and we can at least plan around the baptism and then we'll see what God does with the rest of the evening. Uh, But we'd love for you to come. So you can sign up in the office for um, coming and being baptized next Thursday night. Sean and I have been in a series Uh, these several weeks post-Easter, kind of sitting with the resurrected Jesus. It was kind of our thought process. Many times we do Easter, and we just kind of move on to the next series we want to bring everyone into. Uh, But this year we thought, let's just hit the pause button, because there's a lot of uh, interesting things that Jesus does in his resurrected form that it's, it's important for us to pause and focus on a little bit. And so we decided, let's not just move past Easter into another series. Let's take some time and look at some of those stories before Jesus ascended, before Jesus went back to be this father. There's some very significant things he did. And Paul, um, Sean started with the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus is there to reveal who he is to people's hearts in a very dialogue, conversational way as they journey together to the city of Emmaus. Uh, I came and spoke about one of his appearances where Jesus actually brings peace to our panic. He, bring, bring, he begins to bring clarity to our confusion and purpose to our pointlessness. And then last week, Sean got up and talked about Thomas, the one guy that's like deemed as like, oh yeah, Thomas, the doubting guy. 
but actually that Thomas, in his genuine doubt, stayed present with the disciples, not having the answers given to him yet, because he knew it was true. He just knew that God would cater or customize what he had done to his life, and he could receive in that way. And in his patience and perseverance, in the midst of his doubt, Jesus actually met him. And in fact, we see a picture of a community starting that Jesus is saying, this is how you worship me in community, but doubt is okay in that community. Because doubt can be the thing that forces your heart towards me, and you can continue to grow as you remain present in the community. And so tonight, tonight, that was Saturday, this morning, we're going to continue on with that on one of my favorite stories, um, which is in John chapter 21. And if you don't know the story, just briefly, it's a story where Jesus meets his disciples at the shore and cooks some fish for them. Now, I personally love this story because of a lot of things. And I would probably say because Peter is one of my most favorite disciples. In some ways, I can relate to Peter the most because Peter always blew it. And I know, I'm sure the other disciples made mistakes too, but he, no one ever blew it as bad as Peter. You know, like constantly making a mockery of things, constantly challenging Jesus. He was the one that began to sink in the water. He was always the first to act and then would like panic, like, wait, hold on a second, what am I doing? And in some ways, after three years walking with Jesus, never fully grasped who Jesus was. And we can see that as we reflect on some of Peter's life at the end here. And so I really love this story because we're going to see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, do something in Peter's life. And I think it's a promise for what Jesus has done for all of our lives. But I need to back up a little bit further. Because I believe at the stage of this story, when Jesus is going to arrive on the shore and meet Peter and the disciples, I think Peter has something that he's dealing with. And I believe it's not just guilt of his denial of Jesus. I actually believe that he's probably handling a bit of shame. Now, shame is an interesting thing, and shame is something that we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about in a bit. But shame, we have to realize, is rooted deeper than just our guilt. Guilt being a feeling, shame being a, a sense of not being enough. Where does shame come from? Well, if we're all here, we're agreeing that this is the story. This is the true human story. This is the story for all of humanity. And in this story, it tells us where the root of shame came from. See, in the garden, God created Adam and Eve, and they loved each other, and they loved him, and God loved the fact that they loved the fact that he loved them. It was this mutual exchange of love, and they had all of creation to care for. And every cool of the evening, the angel Lord would come and walk with Adam and Eve, and they would talk about, I don't know, why, you know, Adam chose to call this animal a tiger, or why, I don't know what they talked about, but they talked. And then this beautiful relationship where they knew their role, they knew God's role, they knew what they were made to do, they knew what God was made to do, and everything worked in perfect order. <clears throat> but then there's this little snake on the ground that decided to mess up the order. And we all know the story when Eve first took the fruit and Adam took the fruit and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that moment, they were pushed out of their capacity. They were designed to be people who just received the love of God and expressed their gratitude for the love of God back. But now they wanted to have full knowledge and understanding like God had, but they were not equipped. They were not designed to have that understanding. <clears throat> so what happens? <clears throat> they feel tremendously guilty. Now, if you remember the story, right, as soon as they ate, they eat it, they all of a sudden feel different, and then the angel Lord comes walking through the cool evening. God shows up in the garden to have his hangout time with them. And what occurs? They immediately feel what? Shame. <clears throat> Sorry, that almond latte is in my throat right now. So they immediately start feeling the shame. They feel guilt for what they did. There's a sense of, I feel guilty that I did something wrong, and almost immediately shame sets in, and what do they do? They cover themselves. Before, they could be completely vulnerable. They didn't know that they were naked. They were just there. They were, they were truly a human being, just being there as a human, being loved by God, expressing the love back to him. <clears throat> but in this moment, shame comes in. <clears throat> what is in my throat right now? <clears throat> okay, I think I'm done. Shame comes in, and they have to cover up. They have to hide themselves. Because all of a sudden, in that moment, it's not just a feeling of, oh my goodness, we shouldn't have eaten the apple. In that moment, it's a feeling of, I'm not adequate enough to walk in the garden with this God anymore. And in that moment, shame was rooted in humanity, a feeling of not being adequate enough to have fellowship with God ever again. And we moved from a human being to more of a human doing. 
where we had to begin to do stuff to get over our feeling of shame, whether it was to get acceptance from God, whether it was to get acceptance from each other, we began to constantly start doing things where previous to that we just had to be. My daughter, when she was first born, the sense of love between my wife and I for her was overwhelming. And she didn't even do anything but poop and pee and cry. But, but looking for this little child that we were caring for was put us in such awe. We had so much love because she, you could tell the moment that she loved when her butt was nice and dry. And it made us feel so good that she loved that we did that for her. It was just like this perfect thing. And she didn't do anything for us. If anything, she was a lot of work. But just her existence was amazing. Just her being, just being there was unbelievable. Unfortunately, that goes away. Because as she grows up, that root of shame is in all of us. And she's going to be submitted to a world that says, you have to measure up. You have to look like this. You have to act like this. You have to be here. God will only accept you if you do this or that or this or that. Because that root of shame is within each one of us. So why am I talking about shame so much? Because if we're going to talk about the resurrected Christ, we have to talk about what his resurrected body meant. And what we're going to find here, the story of Peter, one of the most powerful things that Christ did with his, thanks bud, one of the most powerful things that Christ did with his resurrection was he removed the power of that shame over our lives. And in some ways, though we're not back in the garden, we have a picture of where we're headed, knowing that while there's still a shame in the world, it no longer has power over us any longer. John chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Oh, that was so good. Thank you. <clears throat> Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And then they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large numbers of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Peter heard him say this, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many net, even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So basically the disciples are waiting in Galilee because they knew previously Jesus said, come back to Galilee once I've died. In fact, Mary and Martha actually came and told them, hey, we saw the risen Christ, go wait in Galilee. So they're in Galilee hanging out. And what do they do? They're, they're there. They're a bit frustrated. Nothing's really happening. And what do they think? Well, what do we know what to do? And Peter always has some idea what to do. He's like, we're just going to go fish. And everyone's like, okay, we'll go fish. And we can see Peter carries a, a bit of leadership amongst the other disciples. And oftentimes, he was the first one to get out of the boat. He was the first one to challenge Jesus on the fact that Jesus talked about his death and resurrection. He was the first one to attack the guard in the garden. He was the first in many things. In this case, we see he's the first to say, we just have to go do something. Now, it's interesting because what we're going to see here is Jesus is someone that removes the power of shame, and then he makes restorative situations happen out of situations in our life. Because this isn't the first time that Jesus asks them to go catch fish. You might remember in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, Jesus does the very same thing. In fact, the way that Peter was originally called to be disciple of Jesus was he was fishing. Jesus said, throw the net out. They pulled up a large number of fish. And he goes, who are you? Connects to a rabbi. And Jesus says, come with me. And he goes and follows him. So interestingly enough, more than three years later, post Peter's up and down, post Peter's denial of Christ, the resurrected Jesus is appearing in the same situation but everything is going to be different. Everything is going to be different. Because now we're, we're, be, we're past that. We're beyond that. And the resurrected Christ is going to change 
everything. John 21, verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. At that point, Peter's like, come on, bro. Like, we're hanging out. Like, there's fish. Of course I love you. This is awesome. Then he says, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Now Peter's like, okay, like, you know, he gets repetitive before, and sometimes he thinks I'm not listening. And I'm sure at this point he's probably just like, Peter, are you listening? Verse 17. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? At this point, Peter's going, why is he doing this three times? And I'm sure in that very moment, Peter's brought back to the reality that he denied Christ three times. In fact, in that very moment, Peter's probably sitting there going, what's the irony of this right now? We're sitting here over a charcoal fire, warming some fish together, staying warm. And the last time I was over a fire... I was warming myself and I was denying that Christ was who he said he was. And now he's here resurrected. And I'm sure Peter's thinking, oh my goodness, is he going to call me out right now? What is the resurrected Christ going to do right now? Is this this the point where I'm going to get my licking? Is this the point that I'm going to get my correction? Is he he mocking me going through these three things? Are you bringing bringing up that root of shame right now, Jesus, because you want to call me out? Jesus says, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. See, Jesus in this moment, he's not calling Peter's shame out to shame him. He's allowing Peter to know that I know the shame you have in you, and I'm letting you know that the calling on your life is still the same. That you're feeling inadequate because you might have denied me at that fire. In fact, some say, scholars say that where Peter was positioned warming himself, he could have seen Christ being crucified. In fact, Jesus would have seen him denying him. And that's why he ran away. But in this moment, Jesus is this close, resurrected. And you almost got to think, Peter's thinking, is he going to bring up the thing that we're not going to talk about, that I don't want to talk about? Is he going to bring up the thing that I'm carrying inside me, this root of shame? And Jesus is going to bring it up. But he's not going to bring it up saying, Why did you deny me three times? He's going to bring it up by saying, I want to affirm that you know that I love you and that my calling is still the same on your life. That regardless of what you did, my calling has not stopped. Why is that? Because the resurrected Christ removes the power that shame has over our life. The resurrected Christ removes it, takes that away. He fixed something that happened in the garden. He took the power of that shame away. Not just our guilt. And I know we talk a lot about guilt. In fact, guilt is very different than shame. I feel guilty all the time for my parenting, if I'm just being totally honest. Uh, Recently, my son and daughter were in the back of the car, and they were driving me absolutely insane. If any of you have toddlers and you're driving with a six and eight-year-old, when they get going, it's like, holy moly, I don't even know if I'm human in this moment because the thoughts I'm thinking right now. And just in a and I have a very creative mind. So in my creative mind of my thinking, I just look back and said, if you guys don't stop it, I'm going to make you walk barefoot in the canyon behind our house. And there's rattlesnakes there. <laughs> Horrible parent. <clears throat> my daughter goes, but dad, when rattlesnakes bite you, you die. And she goes, why would you do that to us? <laughs> I felt tremendously guilty in that moment. <laughs> why would I have ever said that to my daughter? But I was just so like, would you stop fighting? I just was trying to think of something completely out of the ordinary to stop the fighting. That's a feeling of guilt. A feeling of shame knows when I go inside and go, I'm not fit to be their parents. I'm not worthy to care for these children. I'm not fit to be a human being. I'm not fit to breathe the same air they breathe. That's the shame. That's the deep-rooted stuff. That's the things that we don't talk about. That's the stuff that goes on within our lives. But Jesus is showing Peter, you are adequate enough. You don't have to be frozen by the shame that's in your life because of what you did. You don't, you don't have to do that. In fact, I'm going to redeem, I'm going to restore, I'm going to fix the situation because now you can actually become a new creation of me. I talked on Easter about my family's story, about my mom being a victim of date rape 
wanting to have an abortion and then not doing that and walking out and having me. Great story. The only downside is when I was younger and I learned that story, I felt a lot of shame because I didn't know who my father was. And it was almost would have been better if my parents were divorced. It almost would have been better if my dad would have abandoned me. At least I would have known. But to admit that you are a byproduct of a difficult situation like that and maybe would never know half of your genealogy. And for years I'd go to the doctors and I hated when they would ask me if cancer was in my history because I'd have to admit to them, I don't know because I don't know who my father is. And the follow-up question was, why don't you know who your father was? And I'd have to express that feeling of shame. That feeling of, am I worthy that I should even be living here? But guess what? When I got in touch with the story of Jesus and I found out that I was adopted into his family, his spirit pushed the power of shame out of my life. That I can be a better parent than I might have received having not really known good parents. I can be a better parent because I'm part of the resurrected Christ. That in that Christ, in him, because of what he did, shame has no power over my life any longer. And it's only something that can happen with that. You can't fit anything else. Tony Robbins cannot remove your shame. It just won't work because it, unless it's Jesus Christ, Unless it's found in him, everything else is just a failed attempt. It's a poor, non-waterproof Band-Aid put over it. It won't last. It's only Jesus Christ in what he did on the cross, in his scorning of shame, in his turning of shame, in his despising of shame, as it talks about in Hebrews, that on the cross, ironically, would have been crucified naked on the cross, scorning shame, taking the shame of the world on his shoulders. Just like when shame entered into the garden, people found themselves naked. That he would be on the cross naked with a mockery statement above his head, knowing that he was going to despise shame for you and I. Because guess what? He was going to come back. He was going to be resurrected. He was going to show you that there was power in what he did that could remove your shame from you. Jesus continues on. Verse 18. Very truly I tell you, when you were... Younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Now, this is very interesting that Jesus closes with these two words to Peter. Because fascinating enough, when Jesus foretells that Peter will deny him, he says something a bit different. In John chapter 13, in verse 36, it said, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And then Jesus brings back the scene Reminds Peter of the first time he was called where there was a large net of fish. Reminds Peter of the last time that he denied Christ when when he was warming his hands over the fire and now he's warming his hands over fire on the shore. And then says, listen, there's some things that are going to happen to you. And in fact, we understand that and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But at the closing of his statement, he says to him, guess what, Peter? Now you can follow me. Why can he follow him now? He can follow him now because the resurrected Christ says there's no power of shame and sin over your life any longer. You can walk with me. It doesn't matter what you did. You can walk with me. It doesn't matter your background. You can walk with me. It doesn't matter your family upbringing. You can walk with me. It doesn't matter the things you had to do when you were in the war. You can walk with me. It doesn't matter that people told you you were fat. You can walk with me. It doesn't matter if people told you you were stupid. You can walk with me. It doesn't matter if you have any money. You can walk with me. All those things of shame that you carry within you that you don't talk to anyone about, you can still walk with me because I took shame on the cross and I defeated its power over you. Peter went on when Pentecost happened to be the first one out of the room to start declaring to everyone in the city the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter became the person that that Jesus told him he was going to become, and he began to build his church. And Peter became someone that began to be a leader in that church, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to the point that in the end of his life, when he was captured and said he was going to be crucified, He broke down crying and said, I'm not worthy to die like my Christ died. And they hung him upside down on a cross to kill him. How does that happen? Because the resurrected Christ removed the power of shame over Peter's life. And that's the hope for all of us. 
that we could see ourselves in Peter as like the number one disciple that never got it right. The one that was always quick to ask and slow to think. The one that was always making the wrong statements, confronting Jesus at the wrong times, being violent when he should have been peaceful, falling asleep when he should have been praying, denying Christ when he should have stood for him. And as that shame would have set on him, the feeling of guilt initially, but shame of feeling of inadequate. Maybe G- Peter was thinking when he went back to fishing, well, you know what? I thought I was ma- meant for something more, but actually I'm not. I'm just a dumb fisherman. Jesus came to that shore and said, no, G- no, Peter. I'm the resurrected Christ. In me, if you have faith in what I did, nothing else, only in what I did. If you have faith in what I did, the power of shame is broken over your life. But here's the thing for all of us today. We're comfortable coming to church and asking God to take away the feeling of guilt in our lives. But for some reason, we don't think we're worthy enough that he would remove the shame from our lives. We're comfortable thinking about the feeling like, well, I probably shouldn't have done that. I probably shouldn't have done this. And so I'll come to church and sing a song and it'll feel good because in my singing this song, I feel good about this. And I know, okay, great. Like, oh, I feel so much better. I I know he loves me despite I did that. But then when we go to bed at night, we still feel in our hearts that we're not worthy to breathe the air on this earth. And it might have been because someone said to us. It might have been because of our upbringing. It might have been because of our social situation. It might have been because of a way we've treated people. And we know in the the deepest, darkest recesses of our heart, a feeling of shame and unworthiness. And it makes us sick inside. But then we become a human doing instead of a human being. And we just make ourselves active and we just push it all aside and just keep staying busy and busy and busy. And then we crash and fall out. And then we come back to church, but then we just get busy and busy and busy and busy. I believe The resurrected Christ removes the power of shame of our lives. So we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. Dave's going to come up and we're going to actually have a short time of worship. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about that shame. Because Jesus isn't scared of your shame. He knew Peter's point of shame. He knew that it was a time of him denying Christ three times. So he covered those three times by asking Peter how much he loved them three times. It's not about naming the shame in our life so we can be taken over by it. It's about naming the shame so Jesus can remove the power of it from our lives. I'm not saying that life will be perfect and you won't ever feel guilty or shame again. But what's different now is the resurrected Christ removes that power to dictate over your life. Because many times when shame comes, we get frozen. And we're stuck and we're not growing because we're just covered by the shame. And anytime we start feeling like we're about to break out, we're like, I'm not worthy. And we come right back. I believe supernaturally the resurrected Christ in this moment, this morning, wants for those of you that are here tonight that feel frozen by shame, he wants to set you free. Because that's why he gave his life for you. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have everyone stand up. You're probably already stirring in your heart of what that point is. And we're going to play this song because I think it's such a beautiful song of It almost seems reckless that Jesus would cover our shame. But I want to sing the song because it's a a declaration of what Jesus has done in our life. And if you want to put your hands out and close your eyes and just say, okay, God, I'm going to visualize that shame in my life. And I'm just going to say, just take it from me right now. I believe this morning the resurrected Christ is in our midst wanting to remove that shame from us. Let's sing.